Hello and welcome to the Bookshelf Odyssey. My name is Art and I'm going to be doing something a little new this month for Victober. I've got a at least a mini series planned that I'm calling Distracted by Dickens. I have also turned it into kind of a podcast. I don't know if I'll be doing an ongoing podcast or if this will be just for Victober uh, or what, but I have wanted to do some kind of a Dickens related podcast, especially related to his stories. And thanks to some great conversations uh, in some chats I belong to, as well as I think a comment I made in one of my videos that I was easily distracted by Dickens. And I just all kind of came together. So, what this is going to be, at least for this month, is every week I'll be reading a story written by Dickens or one of his contemporaries, and talking about it a little bit, about what, what I liked about it, what I enjoyed, what I learned from it, uh, things like that. Nothing, nothing too complicated. I love reading Dickens' stories out loud. I think his stories were just made to be read aloud. But uh, Dickens had a very theatrical flair and had a passion for the performing arts. It's not surprising that his writing would then carry that that flavor and that, um, you know, that style. So what I'm going to do for this first episode, it's kind of a cheat. On my YouTube channel, I've already read this story, and I'm just taking some of what I read and talked about in that video, and I'm putting it onto this as an episode. So if you've already listened to that, there's really not going to be anything new for this particular one. But starting next week, I will be reading more. The reason why I'm rehashing his first one from an old video, uh, this was Dickens' very first published short story. And what I did is I went through um, sketches by Boz, and I, I got a handful of his stories and put them in order of publication, because they don't appear that way in the book Sketches by Boz. So I thought this month it would be fun to uh, read his stories through in chronological order. And I and anyway, just I just wanted to start with this first one, and then this also gave me a little bit of uh, wiggle room to uh, to start recording a couple more. Uh, so check out uh, the channel here every Monday. I, I'm hoping to have them out Monday morning to give you a fresh dose of Dickens distraction uh, as we're all going back to work or you know maybe you've had a rough weekend or there's something in your life you're not looking forward to and you just need a moment to be distracted by Dickens. Well this is the channel for it and the first story, I know I'll talk about it more in the, uh, in the, uh, in the actual episode, but uh, it's really funny. Um, and you see in Dickens, even in his first published work, you see his, uh, his, his humor at work, his, his uh, just really lively characters and, and um, well-rounded characters. I, you know, I don't know. It, it's just a real, real joy to read. So. I won't be on camera for the stories itself. Uh, I just think I can get a better sound quality out of it by uh, the way I have for my, as if I record it for a podcast. This way, you know, you don't just have to sit there and watch me looking at you. You know, you can just put me in your ears, go and hit the, the treadmill or go for a walk or do the dishes or whatever it is that you need me to distract you with. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, without any further ado, here is the very first episode of Distracted by Dickens. Welcome to Distracted by Dickens. This is the podcast that explores the life and works of Charles Dickens, along with his contemporaries, his partners, and his friends. We are your weekly dose of Victorian goodness, offering you a moment to relax, unwind, meditate, on some of the greatest works that have ever been put on paper. So I invite you to sit back, relax, and let yourself be distracted by Dickens. And hello and welcome to Distracted by Dickens. My name is Art, and this is the very first episode in which I will be reading A Dinner at Poplar Walk, which is the very first short story that Dickens ever wrote, or ever published, I should say. Uh, reading aloud is one of my favorite activities and, and part of the reason why I started a podcast. Uh, I used to read aloud to my kids uh, for many years. 
and that was always a lot of fun. Uh, we had some fun with the voices and the and and talking about where the story could go, different things like that. So now that they're older, and I don't know, they think it's kind of weird, to, you know, to be in their teens and still have dad read them a bedtime story. I guess uh, beats me. In any case, I'll, I'll be reading uh, a story to you today. It's hard to imagine Charles Dickens doing anything other than being an author, but. As a young man, he did work for uh, a newspaper, and I think he uh, was even a uh, theater critic for a short time. And at one point, he went to go try out to be an actor for this uh, local theater. The day that he was going to go and audition, he woke up with a cold and wasn't able to make it. And he wrote a letter to the um, theater manager and said, you know, I'm going to have to try again next year. Every year, maybe in the spring or something, they would have auditions for that, that coming year. And in that time, he ended up getting published as a fiction writer. And, well, you know, as they say, the rest is history. Uh, and, of course, throughout his life, Dickens loved the, the-, the theater. He-, he loved acting. And he-, he very much popularized the idea of doing a one-man show, especially of his own work, which uh, was a bit controversial at the time. But he loved doing the readings. He loved connecting with his audience. and had such a great love for his reading public, especially if they loved him in return. It's, it's possible it might have been a little bit of an ego boost for him, but I can't say I blame him either. And I want to read to you uh, Dickens' account of how he had his very first published story published before we actually even get to the story. I'm reading from a book called uh, My Early Times, and it's edited by Peter Rowland. And it's a collection of biographical sketches and letters and things kind of forming a autobiography of Dickens's early life up until um, right around the time he wrote Nicholas Nickleby. It covers that period of his life. And he's talking about all the ways that he had come out as a young man, as a journalist, as a theater critic. And then he says this about his very first published story. He said, I had also come out in another way. I had taken, with fear and trembling, to authorship. I wrote a little story in secret entitled A Sunday Out of Town, which I dropped stealthily one evening at twilight into a dark letterbox in a dark office up a dark court in Fleet Street. It appeared in all the glory of print in the December 1833 issue of the monthly magazine, its name transmogrified to A Dinner at Poplar Walk, on which occasion, how well I remember it, I walked down to Westminster Hall and turned into it for half an hour because my eyes were so dimmed with joy and pride that they could not bear the street and were not fit to be seen there. It says, Thereafter, albeit for next to nothing, I took heart to write a good many trifling pieces. Some appeared in the monthly magazine, some in the Morning Chronicle, and early in 1836, a series of these were collected and published in two volumes, illustrated by my esteemed friend, Mr. George Cruikshank. It must be emphasized that these sketches were written and published one by one when I was still a very young man. They were collected and republished while I was still a very young man and sent into the world with all their imperfections, a good many, on their heads. They comprised my first attempts at authorship, with the exception of those tragedies already referred to, achieved at the mature age of eight or ten, and represented with great applause to overflowing nurseries. I am conscious now of their often being extremely crude and ill-considered and bearing obvious marks of haste and inexperience, but they were very leniently and favorably received on their first appearance. So the the very first story he wrote, A Dinner at Poplar Walk, and it would have said it was published by Boz or, or Bose, depending on your accent, I guess. And I, I love his just his reminiscing of the time he he finally saw his first story in print, you know, a little bit of perhaps out, uh, authorial outrage that, oh, they changed my title, but it was so perfect, you know, but then just the excitement of being published overcame any of that. And I like how he uh, would walk past where the, the, the papers were being sold and, and had to kind of just walk to collect his thoughts to uh, get himself under control emotionally. What's, what's funny is that uh, of the many authors I've talked to, I think they would all say that they've had similar experiences with their very first published story, that this almost indescribable, I can't believe this actually happened. Here's my book or my story in print. It has my name on it. This is incredible. So it, it's 
fun to see that Dickens was really, in some ways, like all of us <laughs> when we see that a goal reached. It's interesting that uh, the story was published in December. Dickens has become so connected to Christmas, although uh, this is not a Christmas story. Um, although you, it could be set at Christmas, I suppose. It doesn't really give mention to the season. Uh, and it tells the story of Mr. Minns, and he's a bit of a grump. And as the story says, he doesn't like children and he doesn't like dogs. But then uh, one day his cousin comes to visit him, who happens to have a dog, and also happens to have a young child, and he invites him to dinner uh, because he wants him to be his child's godfather. So as I read you the story, I invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy A Dinner at Poplar Walk by Charles Dickens. A Dinner at Poplar Walk by Charles Dickens Mr. Augustus Minns was a bachelor, of about forty, as he said, of about eight and forty, as his friends said. He was always exceedingly clean, precise, and tidy, perhaps somewhat priggish, and the most retiring man in the world. He usually wore a brown frock coat, without a wrinkle, light inexplicables without a spot, a neat neckerchief with a remarkably neat tie, and boots without a fault. Moreover, he always carried a brown silk umbrella with an ivory handle. He was a clerk in Somerset House, or, as he said himself, he held a responsible situation under government. He had a good and increasing salary, in addition to some £10,000 of his own, invested in the funds, and he occupied a first floor in Tavistock Street, Covent Garden, where he had resided for twenty years, having been in the habit of quarreling with his landlord the whole time, regularly giving notice of his intention to quit on the first day of every quarter, and as regularly countermanding it on the second. There were two classes of created objects which he held in the deepest and most unmingled horror. These were dogs and children. He was not unamiable, but he could at any time have viewed the execution of a dog or the assassination of an infant with the liveliest satisfaction. Their habits were at variance with his love of order, and his love of order was as powerful as his love of life. Mr. Augustus Minns had no relations in or near London, with the exception of his cousin, Mr. Octavius Budden, to whose son, whom he had never seen, for he disliked the father, he had consented to become godfather by proxy. Mr. Budden, having realized a moderate fortune by exercising the trade or calling of a corn chandler, and having a great predilection for the country, had purchased a cottage in the vicinity of Stamford Hill, whither he retired with the wife of his bosom and his only son, Master Alexander Augustus Budden. One evening, as Mr. and Mrs. B. were admiring their son, discussing his various merits, talking over his education, and disputing whether the classics should be made an essential part thereof, the lady pressed so strongly upon her husband the propriety of cultivating the friendship of Mr. Minns in behalf of their son, that Mr. Budden should at last made up his mind that it should not be his fault if he and his cousin were not in future more intimate. I'll break the ice, my love, said Mr. Budden, stirring up the sugar at the bottom of his glass of brandy and water, and casting a sidelong look at his spouse to see the effect of the announcement of his determination. By asking Minns down to dine with us on Sunday. Then pray, Budden, write to your cousin at once, replied Mrs. Budden. Who knows if we could only get him down here, but he might take a fancy to our Alexander and leave him as property? Alec, my dear, take your legs off the rail of the chair. Very true, said Mr. Budden, musing. Very true indeed, my love. On the following morning, as Mr. Minns was sitting at his breakfast table, alternately biting his dry toast and casting a look upon the columns of his morning paper, which he always read from the title to the printer's name. He heard a loud knock at the street door, which was shortly afterwards followed by the entrance of his servant, who put into his hands a particularly small card on which was engraved in immense letters, Mr. Octavius Budden, Amelia Cottage, Mrs. B.'s name was Amelia, Poplar Walk, Stamford Hill. Budden, ejaculated Minns. What can bring that vulgar man here? Say I'm asleep, say I'm out, and shall never be home again. Anything to keep him downstairs. But please, sir, the gentleman's coming up, replied the servant, 
and the fact was made evident by an appalling creaking of boots on the staircase accompanied by a pattering noise, the cause of which Minns could not, for the life of him, divine. Ahem. Show the gentleman in, said the unfortunate bachelor. Exit servant and enter Octavius, preceded by a large white dog, dressed in a suit of fleecy hosiery, with pink eyes, large ears, and no perceptible tail. The cause of the pattering on the stairs was but too plain. Mr. Augustus Minns staggered beneath the shock of the dog's appearance. "'My dear fellow, how are you?' said Budden, as he entered. He always spoke at the top of his voice, and always said the same thing half a dozen times. "'How are you, my hearty?' "'How do you, how do you do, Mr. Budden? Pray, take a chair,' politely stammered the discomfited Minns. "'Thank you, thank you. Well, how are you, eh?' "'Uncommonly well, thank you,' said Minns, casting a diabolical look at the dog, who— with his hind legs on the floor and his forepaws resting on the table, was dragging a bit of bread and butter out of a plate, preparatory to devouring it with the buttered side next the carpet. "'Oh, you rogue!' said Budden to his dog. "'You see, Mins, he's like me, always at home, eh, my boy? Egad, I'm precious hot and hungry. I've walked all the way from Stanford Hill this morning.' "'Have you breakfasted?' inquired Mins. "'Oh, no! Came to breakfast with you!' So ring the bell, my dear fellow, will you? And let's have another cup and saucer and the cold ham. Make myself at home, you see, continued Budden, dusting his boots with a table napkin. Ha ha ha, upon my life, I'm hungry. Minns rang the bell and tried to smile. I decidedly never was so hot in my life, continued Octavius, wiping his forehead. Well, but how are you, Minns? Upon my soul, you wear capably. Do you think so? said Minns, and he tried another smile. Upon my life, I do. Mrs. B. and uh, what's his name? Quite well? Alec, my son, you mean? Never better, never better. But at such a place as we've got at Poplar Walk, you know, he couldn't be ill if he tried. When I first saw it, by Jove, it looked so knowing with the front garden and the green railings and the brass knocker and all that. I really thought it was a cut above. Don't you think you'd like the ham better? interrupted Minns. If you cut it the other way? He saw, with feelings which it is impossible to describe, that his visitor was cutting, or rather maiming, the ham in utter violation of all established rules. No, thank ye, returned Budden, with the most barbarous indifference to crime. I prefer it this way. It eats short. But I say, Minns, when will you come down and see us? You will be delighted with the place. I know you will. Amelia and I were talking about you the other night, and Amelia said, Another lump of sugar, please, thank you. She said, don't you think you could contrive, my dear, to say to Mr. Minns in a friendly way, Come down, sir! Curse the dog! He's spoiling your curtains, Minns! Ha 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 ha! Minns leaped from his seat as though he had received the discharge from a galvanic battery. Come out, sir! Go out! Who? cried poor Augustus, keeping, nevertheless, at a very respectful distance from the dog. Having read of a case of hydrophobia in the paper of that morning, by dint of great exertion, much shouting and a marvelous deal of poking under the tables with a stick and umbrella. The dog was at last dislodged and placed on the landing outside the door, where he immediately commenced a most appalling howling, at the same time vehemently scratching the paint off the two nicely varnished bottom panels, until they resembled the interior of a backgammon board. A good dog for the country, that, coolly observed Budden to the distracted Minns. But he's not much used to confinement. But now, Minns, when will you come down? I'll take no denial, positively. Let's see, today's Thursday. Will you come on Sunday? We dine at five. Don't say no. Do. After a great deal of pressing, Mr. Augustus Minns, driven to despair, accepted the invitation and promised to be at Poplar Walk on the ensuing Sunday at a quarter before five to the minute. Now mind the direction, said Budden. The coach goes from the flower pot in Bishopsgate Street every half hour. When the coach stops at the Swan, you'll see immediately opposite you a white house. Uh, which is your house, I understand, said Minns, wishing to cut short the visit in the story at the same time. No, no, that's not mine. That's Grogus's, the great ironmonger's. I was going to say, you turn down by the side of the white house till you can't go another step further. Mind that, and then you turn to your right by some stables. Well, close to you, you'll see a wall with Beware of the Dog written on it in large letters. Minns shuddered. 
go along by the side of that wall for about a quarter of a mile, and anybody will show you which is my place. Very well. Thank you. Goodbye. Be punctual. Certainly. Good morning. I say, Minz, you've got a card? Yes, I have. Thank you. And Mr. Octavius Budden departed, leaving his cousin looking forward to his visit on the following Sunday with the feelings of a penniless poet to the weekly visit of his Scotch landlady. Sunday arrived. The sky was bright and clear. Crowds of people were hurrying along the streets, intent on their different schemes of pleasure for the day. Everything and everybody looked cheerful and happy, except Mr. Augustus Minns. The day was fine, but the heat was considerable. When Mr. Minns had fagged up the shady side of Fleet Street, Cheapside, and Threadneedle Street, he had become pretty warm, tolerably dusty, and it was getting late into the bargain. By the most extraordinary good fortune, however, a coach was waiting at the flower pot, into which Mr. Augustus Minns got, on the solemn assurance of the cad that the vehicle would start in three minutes, that being the very utmost extremity of time it was allowed to wait by act of Parliament. A quarter of an hour elapsed, and there was no signs of moving. Minns looked at his watch for the sixth time. Coachman, are you going or not? bawled Mr. Minns with his head and half his body out of the coach window. Directly, sir, said the coachman, with his hands in his pockets, looking as much unlike a man in a hurry as possible. Bill, take them cloths off. Five minutes more elapsed, at the end of which time the coachman mounted the box, from whence he looked down the street and up the street, and hailed all the pedestrians for another five minutes. Coachman, if you don't go this moment, I shall get out, said Mr. Minns rendered desperate by the lateness of the hour and the impossibility of being in Poplar Walk at the appointed time. "'Going this minute, sir,' was the reply, and accordingly the machine trundled on for a couple of hundred yards and then stopped again. Minns doubled himself up in a corner of the coach and abandoned himself to his fate as a child, a mother, a bandbox, and a parasol became his fellow passengers. The child was an affectionate and amiable infant. The little dear mistook Minns for his other parent and screamed to embrace him. Oh, be quiet, dear, said the mamma, restraining the impetuosity of the darling, whose little fat legs were kicking and stamping and twining themselves into the most complicated forms in an ecstasy of impatience. Be quiet, dear, that's not your papa. Thank heaven I am not, thought Minns as the first gleam of pleasure he had experienced that morning shone like a meteor through his wretchedness. Playfulness was agreeably mingled with affection in the disposition of the boy. When satisfied that Mr. Minns was not his parent, he endeavored to attract his notice by scraping his drab trousers with his dirty shoes, poking his chest with his mamma's parasol, and other nameless endearments peculiar to infancy, which he beguiled the tediousness of the ride, apparently very much to his own satisfaction. When the unfortunate gentleman arrived at the Swan, he found to his great dismay that it was a quarter past five. The White House, the stables, the beware of the dog, every landmark was passed with a rapidity not unusual to a gentleman of a certain age when too late for dinner. After the lapse of a few minutes, Mr. Minns found himself opposite a yellow brick house with a green door, brass knocker, and door plate, green window frames and ditto railings with a garden in front. That is to say, a small loose bit of graveled ground with one round and two scalene triangular beds containing a fir tree, twenty or thirty bulbs, and an unlimited number of marigolds. The taste of Mr. and Mrs. Budden was further displayed by the appearance of a cupid on each side of the door, perched upon a heap of large chalk flints, variegated with pink conch shells. His knock at the door was answered by a stumpy boy in drab livery, cotton stockings, and high lows, who, after hanging his hat on one of the dozen brass pegs which ornamented the passage, denominated by courtesy the hall, ushered him into a front drawing room commanding a very extensive view of the backs of the neighboring houses. The usual ceremony of introduction, and so forth, over, Mr. Minns took his seat, not a little agitated at finding that he was the last comer, and, somehow or other, the lion of about a dozen people, sitting together in a small drawing room, getting rid of that most tedious of all time, the time preceding dinner. Well, Brogson, 
said Budden, addressing an elderly gentleman in a black coat, drab knee breeches, and long gaiters, who, under pretense of inspecting the prints in an annual, had been engaged in satisfying himself on the subject of Mr. Minns's general appearance by looking at him over the tops of the leaves. Well, Brogson, what do ministers mean to do? Will they go out or what? Oh, why, really, you know, I'm the last person in the world to ask for news. Your cousin, from his situation, is the most likely person to answer the question. Mr. Minns assured the last speaker that, although he was in Somerset House, he possessed no official communication relative to the projects of His Majesty's ministers. But his remark was evidently received incredulously, and no further conjectures being hazarded on the subject, a long pause ensued, during which the company occupied themselves in coughing and blowing their noses, until the entrance of Mrs. Budden caused a general rise. The ceremony of introduction being over, dinner was announced, and downstairs the party proceeded accordingly, Mr. Minns escorting Mrs. Budden as far as the drawing-room door, but being prevented by the narrowness of the staircase from extending his gallantry any farther. The dinner passed off as such dinners usually do, ever and anon amidst the clatter of knives and forks and the hum of conversation. Mr. B.'s voice might be heard, asking a friend to take wine and assuring him he was glad to see him, and a great deal of by-play took place between Mrs. B. and the servants respecting the removal of the dishes, during which her countenance assumed all the variations of a weather-glass, from stormy to set fair. Upon the dessert and wine being placed on the table, the servant, in compliance with a significant look from Mrs. B., brought down Master Alexander, habited in a sky-blue suit with silver buttons, and possessing hair of nearly the same color as the metal. After sundry praises from his mother and various admonitions as to his behavior from his father, he was introduced to his godfather. "'Well, my little fellow, you are a fine boy, ain't you?' said Mr. Minns, as happy as a tomtit on a bird lime. "'Yes. How old are you? Eight next Wednesday. How old are you?' "'Alexander,' interrupted his mother, "'how dare you ask Mr. Minns how old he is?' "'Well, he asked me how old I was.' said the precocious child, to whom Minns had from that moment internally resolved that he never would bequeath one shilling. As soon as the titter occasioned by the observation had subsided, a little smirking man with red whiskers, sitting at the bottom of the table, who during the whole of dinner had been endeavoring to obtain a listener to some stories about Sheridan, called out with a very patronizing air, Alec, what part of speech is B? A verb. That's a good boy, said Mrs. Budden with all a mother's prize. Now you know what a verb is. A verb is a word which signifies to be, to do, or to suffer. As I am, I rule, I am ruled. Give me an apple, Ma. I'll give you an apple, replied the man with the red whiskers, who was an established friend of the family, or, in other words, was always invited by Mrs. Budden, whether Mr. Budden liked it or not. If you'll tell me, what is the meaning of B? B, said the prodigy, after a little hesitation, an insect that gathers honey. No, dear, frowned Mrs. Budden. B double E is the substantive. I don't think he knows much yet about common substantives, said the smirking gentleman, who thought this an admirable opportunity for letting off a joke. It's clear he's not very well acquainted with proper names. He <laughs> he Gentlemen, called out Mr. Budden from the end of the table in a stentorian voice and with a very important air. Will you have the goodness to charge your glasses? I have a toast to propose. Hear, hear, cried the gentleman, passing the decanters. After they had made the round of the table, Mr. Budden proceeded. Gentlemen, there is an individual present. Hear, hear, said the little man with red whiskers. Pray be quiet, Jones, remonstrated Budden. I say, gentlemen, there is an individual present, resumed the host, in whose society I am sure we must take great delight, and, and, the conversation of that individual must have afforded to everyone present the utmost pleasure. Thank heaven he does not mean me, thought Minns, conscious that his diffidence and exclusiveness had prevented his saying above a dozen words since he entered the house. 
Gentlemen, I am but a humble individual myself, and I perhaps ought to apologize for allowing any individual feeling of friendship and affection for the person I allude to to induce me to venture to rise to propose the health of that person, a person that I am sure, that is to say, a person whose virtues must endear him to those who know him, and those who have not the pleasure of knowing him cannot dislike him. Hear, hear, said the company, in a tone of encouragement and approval. Gentlemen, continued Budden, my cousin is a man who, who is a relation of my own. Hear, hear, Minns groaned audibly. Who I am most happy to see here, and who, if he were not here, would certainly have deprived us of the great pleasure we all feel in seeing him. Loud cries of here! Gentlemen, I feel that I have already trespassed on your attention for too long a time, with every feeling of, with every sentiment of, of, uh, gratification, suggested the friend of the family. Of gratification, I beg to propose the health of Mr. Minns. Standing, gentlemen, shouted the indefatigable little man with the whiskers. And with the honors, take your time for me, if you please. Hip, 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 za! Hip, 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 za! Hip, hip, za! All eyes were now fixed on the subject of the toast, who, by gulping down port wine at the imminent hazard of suffocation, endeavored to conceal his confusion. After as long a pause as decency would admit, he rose, but as the newspapers sometimes say in their reports, we regret that we are quite unable to give even the substance of the honorable gentleman's observations. The words, uh, present company, honor, present occasion, and great happiness, heard occasionally, and repeated at intervals with a countenance expressive of the utmost confusion and misery, convinced the company that he was making an excellent speech and accordingly, on his resuming his seat, they cried, Bravo! and manifested tumultuous applause. Jones, who had been long watching his opportunity, then darted up. But in, said he, will you allow me to propose a toast? Certainly, replied Budden, adding in an undertone to Minns right across the table, Devilish sharp fellow that, you'll be very much pleased with his speech, he talks equally well on any subject. Minns bowed, and Mr. Jones proceeded. It has on several occasions, in various instances, under many circumstances, and in different companies, fallen to my lot, to propose a toast to those by whom, at the time, I have had the honor to be surrounded. I have sometimes, I will cheerfully own, for why should I deny it, felt the overwhelming nature of the task I have undertaken, and my own utter incapability to do justice to the subject. If such have been my feelings, however, on former occasions, what must they be now? Now, under the extraordinary circumstances in which I am placed. Hear, hear! To describe my feelings accurately would be impossible. But I cannot give you a better idea of them, gentlemen, than by referring to a circumstance which happens, oddly enough, to occur to my mind at the moment. On one occasion, when that truly great and illustrious man Sheridan was... Now, there is no knowing what new villainy in the form of a joke would have been heaped on the grave of that very ill-used man, Mr. Sheridan, if the boy in drab had not at that moment entered the room in a breathless state to report that, as it was a very wet night, the nine o'clock stage had come round to know whether there was anybody going to town, as, in that case, he, the nine o'clock, had room for one inside. Mr. Minns started up, and despite countless exclamations of surprise, and entreaties to stay, persisted in his determination to accept the vacant place. But the brown silk umbrella was nowhere to be found, and as the coachman couldn't wait, he drove back to the swan, leaving word for Mr. Minns to run round and catch him. However, as it did not occur to Mr. Minns for some ten minutes or so that he had left the brown silk umbrella with the ivory handle in the other coach coming down, and moreover, as he was by no means remarkable for speed, it is no matter of surprise that when he accomplished the feat of running round to the swan, the coach, the last coach, had gone without him. It was somewhere about three o'clock in the morning when Mr. Augustus Minns knocked feebly at the street door of his lodgings in Tavistock Street, cold, wet, cross, and miserable. He made his will next morning, and his professional man informs us, in that strict confidence in which we inform the public, that neither the name of Mr. Octavius Budden nor of Mrs. Amelia Budden 
nor of Master Alexander Augustus Budden, appears therein. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's story. I want to thank you for joining me to uh, enjoy Dickens's very first published story. Uh, I I thought this one was was hilarious. Uh, you know, you can really see his humor, and and just even in just a few pages, the the sharp characteristics that are contained in his stories. Mister Min's is definitely a grump and and i was kind of appalled though to read the the line about how he wouldn't baffle an eye at you know the execution of a dog or a child you know either one was the same to him he, he wouldn't care so yeah this dude really hated <laughs> hated children and from the sounds of it he disliked people i i love how he's describing when some when uh, his cousin comes to visit him it's this dreadful experience that he is facing you know he he doesn't want people visiting him he's kind of a curmudgeon possibly an introvert he just wants to be left alone you know and there are days where i can identify with that i hope you enjoyed that story i look forward to reading another one and until next time happy reading take care well that wraps it up for the inaugural episode of Distracted by Dickens. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to listen to the audio podcast version, I'll have a link down below. And I would really love to know what you think. Um, There is plenty, plenty of Victorian literature that would lend itself to a very long-lasting podcast series. And as I mentioned, I love reading these stories aloud. Uh, Audiobook narration is uh, a hobby I want to try to develop. So that's part of one of my motivations behind this is to try to improve and get better at doing that. I will be back next Monday. So that would be October 9th with the next episode of Distracted by Dickens. I'll be reading Mrs. Joseph Porter, first published in January of 1834. Uh, That promises to be a fun one, so I can't wait to read it to you. So until next time, I hope you remain distracted by Dickens. Take care.